not that I was rushing you, Brian. I just wanted you to hurry up. I am so glad that uh, my grandson Liam is with us this morning. Uh, he brought his mother and father so they could visit too. And uh, by the way, Cody is my favorite son-in-law. Uh, and of course, Taylor is my favorite daughter. But I'm counting on you not to tell them that I say the same thing when my daughter Amber and her husband are here. That they are my favorite. But in any case, we are so glad that they are here and that we're getting to enjoy some time, some time with them. Well, there it is. In the graphic today, the, uh, oh, we have two graphics. Hello. Okay. Interesting. So, in any case, in our graphic today, I believe the solution to where human suffering comes from can be wrapped up really in the, uh, the picture that I have on here. I don't oftentimes spend time with the graphics or the picture of my PowerPoint. But I want you to know that in regard the, the, the short story of where does human suffering come from can be summed up in the characters of this picture. First of all, in the frailty and the brokenness and perhaps corruptedness of mankind. You see the fellow there, broken, soiled, and corrupted, with a hammer and a, and a spike in each hand for crucifying the Christ. And man is the resource of much of our suffering. And secondly, we see Jesus there as the gracious Lord to redeem him and to bring him back. But there were costs to that. And it also one day uh, there will be judgment because of those who reject that moment. And so the series we're in right now is the question of human suffering. Last week we spent time with discussing the benefits of human suffering. That indeed there are some results or consequences of human suffering that first of all may make it palatable, but secondly somewhat explains its cause as well, and we'll be looking at that today. But where does human suffering come from? Certainly God is behind some of it. We're not going to alleviate him from responsibility about it. And I'll spend time this morning talking about God's role in suffering. But certainly he's not to blame for all suffering because the choices and decisions of man have a huge impact on how much suffering is in their life, their family's life, and their society's life. And so we'll be looking at that today. The question was asked, though, concerning about suffering, in this particular case, being born blind. In John chapter 9 and verse 1, Jesus had passed by and saw a man that was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him this poignant question, Teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? The assumption there that it had to be the result of sin. Jesus answered that it was not a result of man's sin or of his parents but that the power of God might be displayed in him. You see, to this, Jesus points to an entirely different purpose for why this man was born blind. It was so that God could be glorified in his life. A miracle was about to happen. The grace of God about to be poured out on him. And it was going to be a message to all, including to that man. The gracious Lord, the loving God, that they served. There are many sources of suffering, though. And though the disciples tried to place a simplistic question as being the result or the cause of it all, it's not quite that simple. There are many causes of human suffering and pain. But as I said before, God is a part of that. Part of the suffering that goes on in humans is a suffering that brought about at the work of God. First of all, there's the natural laws. God created all that there is. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God. He made everything, and He made everything as it was in the beginning, and at least, the way He made it. And so there were natural laws about it. He says that everything was created by God so that what is seen is not made out of the things that are visible. Ergo, 
the atheistic evolutionist is completely false and wrong. God created everything, fiat. But with that, he created laws, laws of nature that dictate how our lives will go in many ways. Imagine a world that doesn't have the laws of physics that involve such things as gravity. If there was no gravity, you and I would be flying off of this globe as with everything else on it. And so we're grateful that the laws of physics provide for the law of gravity and keep us here fixed firmly. But it is that same law of gravity that if you defy it, climb upon a church building, a, a, a building, and jump off, that same gravity will take your life. When a plane loses its engines and it falls from the sky as a result of gravity, Gravity can be both a good thing as well as a source of suffering and pain. Friction. The friction that enables uh, your uh, car to stop when you apply the brakes is the same friction that can cause rug burns and road rash if you were to skid across the road. Heat is such a good thing. It is because of heat that you and I stay warm in the winter. But that same heat is involved in the fires that burn down a house or destroy a field in flame. Cold is a good thing. I love to have a cold, cold glass of lemonade or iced tea. And yet at the same time, it is cold that can freeze a man or woman to death in the absence of shelter. And so the laws of physics are part of the cause of that, and indeed God is responsible for the laws of physics. But it all comes down to this. The laws of physics work in our favor as long as we don't deny the rules of God, the law of God regarding those laws of physics. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45, Jesus simply says that God makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends the rain on the just and the unjust. The laws of nature are equal for all of us. But then also in regard to God being involved, there is a classroom to suffering and pain, and human suffering. In Hebrews chapter 5, Verse 7 and 8. The Bible says that Jesus offered up prayers with loud cries and tears to him that was able to save him from death. That was his prayer in the garden, you remember, the night of his betrayal and execution. And as he prayed, the text says, and though he was a son, yet he learned obedience through the things that he suffered and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all that obey him. But I want you to notice this. Jesus learned in the midst of his suffering. And if the Son of God can learn such things as obedience and character and empathy and steadfastness and faithfulness, all of these things occurred in the heart and the life of Jesus, and it was all culminated in this very moment of him facing his own betrayal and execution. And the text says Jesus learned in that classroom. Certainly, you and I should also learn. The problem is, is that a lot of people do not learn. They go through 12 years of education in our school system, and they come out of it not a whole lot brighter than they were when they went in. It all has to do with their applying themselves to it, their participation in attempting to learn. And so it is also in the schoolhouse of suffering and human pain. There are things that you could never learn without courage integrity, endurance, steadfastness, and the sympathy and empathy for others are all things taught in the household classroom of suffering. Thirdly, there is the issue of discipline. Again, in regard to what God has in his part in suffering, the Bible teaches that God does in fact discipline his children, much like any father or mother would her children. In Hebrews 12 and verse 6, it says, God disciplines the one he loves. And there is where the discipline is rooted. It's not because they want to, he wants to be abusive. It's not because he wants to cause human suffering and pain, but rather he is disciplining those he loves when they are violating that which they need to do. And so the text says, God disciplines the one he loves. He chastises every son whom he receives. For God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not discipline? Verse 9 goes on to say, We had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. Shall we much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? He disciplines us not so much that we may, not, He disciplines us 
for our good so that we might share in his holiness. And then verse 11 says this. All discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but it yields the fruit of righteousness. Again, the classroom of suffering brings about even through the discipline that our Father gives us. And so I, I know that when my son disobeyed me as a boy, uh, when he did something wrong with his bicycle that he was forbidden to do, I'd take his bicycle away from him. And therein is the chastisement. Hopefully he would learn from that. But I didn't do that because of hatred or because of meanness. I did it out of love that he might learn. And fourthly, in regard to God's work, there is the matter of judgment. I'm telling you that the judgment of God is in fact a good thing. In the days of the flood, back in Genesis chapters 5 through 7, you'll recall that mankind was, every thought and intent of their heart was only evil continually. And in that context of world society, when society decayed so badly that it was corrupt so much that all society would do, all that men would do is create pain and anguish and harm because their every thought and intent was evil. It was in that context that God brought judgment to cleanse the world so that those who were righteous, Noah and his family, could survive in such an environment. And having brought them through the flood, he started again. But again, the judgment of the wicked on the surface has much pain and suffering involved, but it is to the good of those who are his. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah, a very similar story. I've heard those who are skeptics and reject God, I've heard them say, well, how could God be a loving God? Look at Sodom and Gomorrah. They destroyed the entire city. Yeah, and that entire city was wicked. In the conversation with Abraham, the angel of the Lord had made the deal that. And they even found ten righteous people among that whole city. They would have spared it. But it was out of the judgment of God against the wicked that pain and suffering was brought. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30 and 31, then we read, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The threat of judgment, though, has purpose. In every case, the judgment of the wicked does two things. First of all, it establishes the justice and character of God. He's not a liar. He says that if you will not surrender to him, if you in fact become wicked and evil and are corrupting the society around you, he will judge you. That is the fear for my nation today, is that my nation is becoming so much more like Sodom and Gomorrah. And how can God restrain his judgment against them? for the sake of those who are righteous within that nation. So it is the judgment of God, though it appears harsh, is in fact itself a loving thing. It rescues the righteous out of the hands of the wicked, and therein is the purpose. But secondly, there is the fact that Satan is at work, along with his devil-driven evil men. First of all, in the aspect of Satan savaging lives, Satan is very busy. In the same way in which God has not abandoned us or left this world, Satan too is here and working his havoc among men and among those who would be willing to serve him. Peter writes, 1 Peter chapter 5, Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. We had a story here just this past week of a man who was, and I forget where the zoo was at, but the man was intoxicated. He was drunk on alcohol. And somehow in his stupor of drunkenness decided it was a good idea to climb the fence at a zoo, at the lion's cage. And they mauled him to death. So it is that Satan goes about as a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. That passage has meaning, my friend. Sometimes you and I should feel the breath of that lion at the back of our neck because he's after us. Sometimes you and I should be listening for the subtle roars in the weeds near us, for Satan is after us. And the Bible says that is so. And he does such things that are ravaging mankind, the, the, the sadness, the, the horrendous hatred, and, and the violence that men do to one another at the hands of Satan and at the bidding of his servants, men driven by evil. 
I'm telling you that when a guy walks into a school or a movie house or a marketplace and he kills scores of people, that's not God doing that and it's not guns doing that. That is Satan doing that and the evil men that serve his cause doing that. And therein, my friend, is the cause of human suffering. It is not because God is evil. It is because men can be doing very evil things at the behest of Satan. There's also the issue of persecution. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 32. The Hebrew writer says that you and I should recall the former days when you endured hard struggles with suffering. Watch this. For you were publicly reproached and afflicted. That's persecution. And so the suffering in this text is pointing directly at what Satan has done in bringing about persecution. I sadly predict in our nation that the time is coming in which practicing your religions will become more and more difficult. That our society is going to become more and more against the freedom of your religion, along with many other things that you count sacred. And as a result of that, I believe the persecution of Christians is going to become greater in our nation in future years. Our whole society is on a downhill mudslide. And but for the righteous among us, and the prayers that we offer, as was offered this morning in behalf of our country. Pray for our country. Because I'm telling you, Satan is wreaking havoc among American people today. All you got to do is watch a TV set on the news any evening as cities burn and people do violent and hateful things. There's also the issue of Satan's temptations. But Satan tempts us, even as he did Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, it was Satan that tempted Jesus in the wilderness and broke his heart and pushed him to the brink of sin over which he did not uh, cons get consumed by it. He resisted those temptations and did not sin, but nonetheless, the suffering he went through, the hunger pains he was feeling as Satan was trying to tempt him to turn these stones into bread so that he could fill his empty stomach. And yet Jesus would not succumb to that temptation, but you know there was suffering in the midst of that. Then also Job in the long ago. Though it is true that God allowed Satan to do to Job what he did, God didn't cause what happened to Job. Satan did that. So it is in the lives of men today that Satan is going about as a roaring lion, causing much suffering. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, though, Paul gives this promise. He says, God will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with every temptation will provide the way of escape that you may be able, may be able to endure it. And I pray that God makes that door wide and obvious so that when you and I face the sufferings of temptation, that we will find that door and make that escape because God will not let Satan do what he wishes. You and I can resist the roaring lion, and he will flee from us, James writes. Thirdly, cause of suffering in your life and mine is laid at the feet of our fathers and forefathers. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 51, Stephen is preaching. He's about to die for preaching. But he's preaching to a bunch of people who hate God's people. And in this sermon, he said basically this statement, you're just like your daddy. Now, sometimes that's a good statement. In this case, it was not. Listen to Stephen's words as he says, you stiff-necked people. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. See, you just like your daddy. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, whom you yourselves murdered. And so he says, you are no, no different than your fathers. This is a message for us who are sitting here right now. Those of you that are fathers, grandfathers, uncles, when the little ones that are in your household or in your family, when they grow up, if others say concerning them, you know what, you're just like your dad. You're just like your grandfather, just like your uncle. Is that going to be a good statement or a bad statement? Because be assured of this. Those that we bring into this world, those little ones will, to a great extent, grew up and become just like you. It is my admonition that you would respond. If you have sin in your life, that you will do what you need to do to get right, to get right with God. I don't like cottage cheese. 
and I don't like Brussels sprouts. Cannot stomach them at all. The next time you invite me over to your house, and I hope you will, please don't cook Brussels sprouts nor serve cottage cheese. I despise those. But I can with all honesty tell you why I despise those. Because my dad despised those, and I grew up all through my childhood with my dad turning his nose at the cottage cheese and telling me why I should do so also. And Brussels sprouts as well. My wife loves both of them and eats them on a regular basis because her mother loved Brussels sprouts and cottage cheese. My point is simply this. We have such an impact on our children and grandchildren. God help us. If someday a preacher says concerning your children or grandchildren, you're lost, son, because you're just like your dad or just like your mama or your grandpa. Curse of the forefathers is a very serious thing. And it all begins with Adam. In Romans chapter 5, Paul writes that sin came into the world through one man. It was our great, 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 and so on back to Adam. He says, that's where sin came from. It didn't just happen. One man introduced himself and following generations to sin. Sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin. And so you see the suffering of death is a result of our forefathers. So he says there. And then he says, so death spread unto all men like a cancer, like a ravaging virus, like COVID-19 spread among us all because all have sinned. And again, he's making the case. Because you're just like your dad. Adam sinned, and we're not going to heaven or hell because of Adam. However, it is where we learned how to be the people we were. It's from our forefathers. Look at all the suffering that's going on in the world as a result of parents' actions. How many crack babies there are born into this world? And I hope you don't know, you know what that is. But I'll tell you, there are plenty of people that do know what a crack baby is or the children of alcoholics. I mean, how many, how many people are being raised today for the third or fourth generation of being raised up in a fatherless home? And as a result of that, all of the, the turmoil and the chaos, we have whole sectors of our society, whole aspects of major cities in our country, and that the, the whole dilapidation, the whole destruction and corruption of those communities can be laid at the foot with no parental control and the lack of fatherhood for generations. Our forefathers have a huge impact, or the lack of our forefathers has a huge impact on the pain and suffering in our society. Fourthly, self-inflicted choices, and I'm going to have to pick up the pace. No, I'm not. I'm going to close it out right here. I have many more reasons for why we suffer. And we're going to look at the remainder of these in next week's sermon. I'm going to leave you with this thought right here. The vast majority of suffering that we see in this world is not a result of God and what He's doing in our lives. It's not even a matter of Satan and what He's doing in our lives. It is a matter of ourselves and the choices we make. The sin choices we make oftentimes bring about consequences. How can a guy go out and get drunk, be involved in a car wreck that harms somebody, how can that drunk shake his fist at God and say, oh, you're, you're a mean God? No, my man, it's your fault. You're the one that drank the alcohol. It was your choice to do what you did. When car wrecks occur, when, when, when someone who has uh, abuse issues in their life and their family is wrecked, their children taken, their, their lives broken, their jobs lost, all because of their own sinful choices. A man that works for a business and then steals from that business cannot shake his fist at God as though God is the blame for losing their job when they themselves made the choice, for example, to steal. When people surrender their lives and their hearts to Satan, they cannot blame God for the choices that they themselves made in choosing Satan over God. Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 spoke about two kinds of people. The wise man who built his house upon the rock and the foolish man who built his house upon the sand. The difference between the two, the one who built his house upon the rock was willing to listen to what Jesus said and to do what Jesus said. He made that distinctive choice. And because of that, his house, his home, was founded on a rock. 
all based on his choices. Now, that doesn't mean that storms don't come because that story goes on to say in Matthew 7 that storms would come. Both for the guy who built his house upon the sand as the man who would not do what God said. He built his house upon the sand and it says that the winds came, the rains came, the floods came, and it destroyed his house. But of the wise man, he says, he built his house upon the rock, which was in obedience to what God said. And it says the rains came, the storms came, the winds and the floods came, and his house stood because it was built upon the rock. I want you to see that in both cases, suffering came. In both cases, storms came. But the house that stood, the life that stood, was the one founded on the rock. And that was a matter of self-choices. The one who collapsed and fell was because of the sin choices in their lives. And so I bring you to a decision point this morning. As we consider why we suffer, sometimes, sometimes God is involved in why we're suffering. Sometimes suffering is a result of our own sinful choices. Have you made choices today that has brought brokenness into your life? Are there things in disarray in your life, your home, that are a direct result of your choices? Will you not repent of those bad choices? Will you not come forward and we'll pray with you that God would forgive you? And here's the amazing thing. Just as this image in the picture, he would be there to lift you up. Even while you have the, 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 the hammer and the spike in your hand with which you would kill him with. If you would turn to him, Surrender into his arms. He will lift you up. And he will heal you. If you're not yet a Christian, will you not be baptized into Christ so your sins might be washed away? Right now as we stand and as we sing. you have a great and marvelous week that's filled with the grace and the love of God. It is because of that grace and love that we can endure whatever human suffering we face. Shall we pray our most gracious and kind Heavenly Father? We're just so thankful for all the many things you do for us. We have so many things every day that you bless us and watch after us. We are so thankful for them. We're thankful for everyone who's present this morning, Father. And we're thankful for the wonderful weather that we're presently having. But, Father, there are many that were mentioned that were troubled and ill. We pray that you be with them. There are also some that may not have been mentioned and some that we are not even aware of. But we know that you are, Father. We pray that you would look after them and guide them and strengthen them. Father, we have a number of problems, which we always do have, really. But with all this pandemic situation that we're having around the world, we need help. And we need you to help us to get through these difficult times, Father. Father, we have so many problems around the world in our political areas, so many countries, and, and in this country, and so many towns, so many situations. Father, we pray as 
once again that you would be with our leaders and give them the wisdom that we might grow closer to thee and that you would help us get through this and bless us. Father, we're so thankful for the, the medical people that are helping us in so many ways and be with them and be with the first responders and be with our police officers. And, and we're just so thankful and we're thankful for our military. We ask that you to look after them and we pray for their safety. Also, Father, we pray that you would go with us now as we prepare to depart. Be with us, guide, guard, and direct us, and forgive us when we fail thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.